Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our next door to door episode. I'm Lainey Mays, joined by my colleague. Hi, everyone. I'm Essie. And, and <laughs> B is <Yeah>. here. <laughs> Yes, so Virginia is not joining us today, but we uh, are here to have a really fun conversation with two debut authors. Um, not only did, are you both debut, but they have some, some strings that pull all these books together. Strong women, they're both historical and set in the South, which I have to say I was pretty excited about. We talked about before we got on um, because I'm a fellow Southerner. And uh, I would like to introduce today Caroline Frost. Hi. Hello. Authors, author of Shadows of Pecan Hollow. And then we have Adele Myers, author of The Tobacco Wives. Hi, everyone. Hi. So we were talking before we got on about how you guys haven't actually met, but you knew kind of each other in a way. Mm -hmm. you want to talk about that. Yeah, we've been, well, we've been on a couple of, um, I guess, appearances. Um, and uh, I read her novel and I just, loved it and so I reached out to her on Instagram and just to express my appreciation for her beautiful book oh thank you and I just got a copy of yours as well which I haven't had a chance to dig into but I'm very excited so great to have a chance yeah Yeah, we could pull we could bring you guys together I kind of I love that (laughs) Um, and so, like I said, these books are, we have these strings that pull us and they were so, so wonderful. And it's just, uh, they're great debuts to dive into. And so we, before we put you guys into our respective green rooms, uh, with our, you know, virtual cookies that we have, Mm -hmm. we maybe want to talk about libraries because you both were just so, so nice to send me a list of the libraries in your life that have made a difference or that are around you and that you go to. And so, I just want to give the, a chance for you guys to shout them out. So I don't know, Caroline, you want to tell them about your, your list of libraries? Of course, sure. Well, I just uh, have such a soft spot in my heart for librarians. And um, uh, just thinking about uh, Miss Sims at my um, elementary school and Luskin Library in Houston. That's where my mom would take us growing up. And, um, and then just got to shout out San Rafael Branch of the Pasadena Library, which is walking distance from my house, lucky me. Okay, and then Adele, you have your list. Yes, I do. So um, I grew up in Asheville, North Carolina, and we have several branches there, but the one that um, where my mother took me quite a bit when I was young and had a big impression on me was um, in North Asheville on Merriman Avenue. There's a, a branch of the library there. And then I live now in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm within walking distance of the Brooklyn Public Library, which is a gorgeous space and um, you know a wonderful place uh, that I take my son and, and that I frequent, so. Again, I'm, it's an honor to talk to a librarian audience today. Yeah, that's so great. I love I loved that because both of you were like, yes, list. Here are like all the people. I loved it. Uh, we were sure to um, tag them. So hopefully they can make it today. Well, um, without further ado, because we have a lot to talk about, we are going to put Adele into the green room. So goodbye. We will see you soon. Bye for now. <laughs> Okay. All righty. So let's talk about shadow, Shadows of Pecan Hollow. So uh, you grew up in, in Houston, Texas, like you said, and you live in the LA area now. And this is your mm-hmm. first novel. It's set in Texas in the 70s and 90s. Do you want to tell them a little bit about the book and what it's about? Oh, sure. Um, so this is a book about a... Um, a girl who was great raised in foster care, abandoned by her mother at birth. And she uh, escapes a foster home and is picked up by a charming, um, but not so good stranger um, who raises her, grooms her as his partner in crime um, and eventually takes her as his lover. She escapes the situation and um, escapes to a little town called Pecan Hollow. And um, 13 years after she escapes, um, her, this man, Manny, his name's Manny, uh, he, is, he gets out of prison and he comes to find her 
and to settle the score. So part of the story takes place in the past when she was a girl um, and coming of age and part of it takes place um, in this, in the nineties um, in Pecan Hollow where she lives with her 13 year old daughter. Yeah. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a, there's some tough parts to it. It's definitely an adult novel, um, but there's also a lot of fun stuff. And I think it's a really great kind of um, tense, exciting, and I hope uh, moving read. Um, I really do my best to try to know these characters from the inside out and to make their um, emotional arcs and their stories believable and relatable, even if they're, you know, difficult to um, like, I hope they're not difficult to understand. Yeah, I, I think it was so, I mean, your writing is so beautiful, but it, there are some some flawed people in there and mm -hmm. like that really comes through. I really, I love Valentine so much. And I think that, that this book really took me to those places where it's so gritty and like these people have been through so much. I love her when she's a little girl. Like she's just, she's got so much spunk and I just, mm -hmm. I loved it. And I think there's so much love for your book coming in. I mean, we have a publisher's weekly quote. We have, let's see, Janet Fitch, uh, drenched in regional detail and told in gritty, sensational prose. Uh, we love Lou Bernie here at LLF, <laughs> and he gave a quote, great quote saying, a hugely satisfying slow burn of a novel that builds to a retching, unforgettable blaze. Uh, <laughs> explores the lives of our complex, arresting characters with nuance, compassion, and an unwavering gaze yeah that's so kind <laughs> he is so kind but he didn't have to say that and that's an amazing quote well um, I won't get tired of uh, hearing that one read out loud <laughs> yeah <laughs> right yeah of course I mean there's so many I could go on I, I will not read to all of them but there are like uh Stacey Swan yeah Eleanor Lippman there's so many great quotes um and like I said, it is so it is so gritty and there are some tough scenes. I'm not going to spoil anything, but there are some where I'm like, oh, heartbreaking, but so beautiful. Um, and so a lot of the book is, you know, about your these strong women, uh, the strong woman specifically and the familial ties that she has. Um, whether that be blood or, <laughs> or found. Um, and so Kit is kind of this force to be reckoned with, but what, what made her this way? And do you think she was shaped or more confirmed in her actions by Manny and their relationship? Oh gosh, that's a great question. Um, well, what made her this way? I, I think that's a great question because that's always my curiosity. Um, I am so drawn to difficult characters. I think this might be um, informed by my work. I, I'm trained as a psychotherapist um, and have had a practice, a private practice for the last um, 10 years. And, you know, people come in with, with tough stuff and, um, and I work with a lot of couples at odds with each other and they can't understand each other. Um, and they may even present as unlikable or difficult or irritating. Um, but I'm just so curious about what, you know, what's going on in their heart that's causing them to act this way. Um, so I really needed that backstory, the, the kid's story um, uh, of, you know, what led up to this point to make her so tough and, and uh, almost feral, you know, just like visceral, violent, um, reactive, and, um, you know, it, it shows up as strength, but I think it comes from a lot of vulnerability and a lot of pain. So I, I actually call it toughness. Um, I think she, she says something similar to her daughter, Charlie, you know, I, I, I'm not strong, I'm tough, you know, you're the strong one. Um, and uh, she certainly is toughened by the way that she was raised in foster care and through her hardships and she, um, I think the heartache that she feels from, um, from Manny, you know, closes her off further. Um, but the, the kind of confusing question that I present is, was it 
were, is she worse off for being, you know, loved in this toxic, horrific, exploitative way by Manny? Or was, would it have been worse for her never to have been loved at all? And that's something that she struggles with because there was one part of being held, you know, seen, taken, looked after that she had never known before. Um, so that's, that's one of her main struggles is like, what, what is this feeling that I have for him? I know he's bad, but I, I still feel love. You know, what does that mean? Oh, oh, when you said that, is it better to not be loved or to, to go through that? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's so true. It's a and really beautiful struggle. Um, Cause I just, I admired Kit so much um, while I was reading it, especially she's not only just emotionally tough. I mean, you even made it to the point where she was physically tough and just where she could have her eyes sewn or her, her skin sewn or with these stitches and it didn't bother her. And in fact, she made it, if she made it so that it would bother somebody else like that one thing she has to hold on to is so you made her, her toughness come out in so many beautiful ways. I loved reading that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it, you know, it, again, like it, um, it show it looks tough and it looks strong, but it really, it comes from this place of being so harmed that she had to divorce herself, you know, unconsciously divorce herself from sensation just to block it out so she could function. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm just gonna show the, the cover. Sorry, we should have had it up earlier. Oh, yeah. It's a gorgeous cover. Oh. Thank you, isn't it beautiful? Yeah. Oh, I it just love the, it. Like, I'm happy to the look encroaching, at. like, kind of darkness. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oof. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. Uh, oh, so like I said, there, it, it reminded me kind of a Valentine in that way that it's really gritty and Southern in Texas. And um, are there other, te like, southern authors that influenced your work I mean I guess it could be any author but southern how long do we have <laughs> I know it's not really a fair question but <laughs> yes yes um oh my gosh so many um so yes and I loved I love Valentine too Elizabeth Wetmore she's so talented um and I think that was her debut novel which just blows my mind you guys in Texas are knocking it out of the park. <laughs> we kind of, we kind of, uh, just like let all of the, <laughs> the feeling and the thoughts and the ideas gather. And then we just explode. It's like a oil well or something. <laughs> um, so I love, uh, Truman Capote. I love, um, uh, Tennessee Williams. I've read a lot of Larry McMurtry. Oh my goodness. So much John Steinbeck, um, Flannery O'Connor, uh, so, so many, um, Cormac McCarthy. Those are some of my favorites. Those are all really good choices. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I ask, I, I believe I heard that the story was like 10 years in the making. Like it, it was in the back. You said that your children were younger than the story itself. And yeah, but it just like, took ah. a long time. <laughs> Yeah, it took a long time to, to make it. And can you just tell us how Kit's arc has changed over that time? Because I'm sure it was, oh, yeah. I'm sure it was influenced by so much. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So 10 years. Um, so I, it started all with a kind of a period of intense emotional turmoil for me. And so I, I wrote it as a screenplay in like two weeks, just as sort of a I don't know, cathartic, like I had to get, I was, I was angry and I was getting my anger down. And the kind of the seed was, um, what would it be like to, uh, not have a filter to not, um, worry about hurting people and to just like <laughs> fully inhabit my painful feelings? Like what kind of a person would just be violent when she felt like being violent rather than holding back. And so it started with that. And then it, it turned into um, kind of a Bonnie and Clyde caper story. Um, but as I uh, resolved my relationship that I was upset about and got married and then had um, three beautiful kids now, uh, I, I became much more interested in her healing uh, 
arc. And so I wanted to know what made her this way and then how the heck does someone get out of uh, an, a, a state of such intense trauma? How does one come back to herself? How does one come back into relationship with other people? Um, and yeah, I guess I'll have to read the book to find out. Um, but I would say the general, um, the general path that I found was um, through action, through community, and um, through forgiveness. So <laughs> I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I actually had a question. Was, like, was it only Bonnie and Clyde for these crimes? Like, it, was there anyone else that you took kind of inspiration for for their run on the run? You know, I watch a, a lot of uh, 80s and 90s thriller movies. I read, but I watch a lot more than I read probably. And, um, and so I was just in a headspace of watching like, um, oh God, what was I watching? Sleeping with the Enemy and Single White Female and Blood Simple and uh, Fargo and uh, Fargo was a little bit later, but I just, I, I don't know, I was just sort of in that headspace. So it was, I was feeling violent. I was feeling dark and gritty and those, those themes and images really have stuck with me. I, I think I watched a lot of that in my formative years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we have a couple of photos. I don't know if you want to show sure. them and talk about them. I would love so, to. Let's see. This one. Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> um, one thing I didn't mention is that Pecan Hollow is very loosely based um, on a little town that um, is near my father's ranch. So my father lives out in the country. And my mom lives in the city in Houston. He's about 40, 40 minutes uh, west of Houston. And this is where my earliest memories um, came from was, was the ranch. I still dream about the ranch um, and it's called Pecan Acres. Uh, and so my father lives on like about 80 acres of pecan groves. And um, it's just a beautiful place, but it's also full of fire ants and mosquitoes and yellow jackets and dirt daubers and stuff. It's like, it's beautiful and it's also thorny and it's hot and sweltering in the summer. And, and I just thought that was a perfect place to set this story. Um, and I also just had internalized so much of the sights and smells and sounds of, of um, this, this area in Fort Bend County. So this is a picture of me and my husband on our wedding day um, at Con Acres on a beautiful um, hired Longhorn, uh, who, whose name I forget, I'm sorry, um, but she was very sweet. <laughs> you can see the pecan trees behind us. Love it. That is the nicest photo. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is me at probably 16. I was waitressing in town uh, for the summer maybe, or no, this looks like it's in around Thanksgiving. Um, and that's with a turkey that we did not eat. I think that was Stumpy. Stumpy the turkey Stumpy. Um, <laughs> and um, so that's just in the same spot but facing the other direction that's a house my dad um, kind of I guess he designed and built there on the property and uh, just spent a lot of time there's my little brother David oh, Stumpy that's urban. hilarious <laughs> okay I think one more let's see and that is a sign, a really cool vintage sign of the Pecan Acres Ranch. Uh, this was my grandfather, he was Vernon Frost. Uh, he raised beautiful Brahmin cattle um, and had a cattle business. And he also had a pecan operation. So he, he grew pecans and sold them. Um, he was a really wonderful man. And just below the cow is um, my grandmother, Mimi. Well, uh, her name was Inza and she was an identical twin. She was just beautiful and sweet. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really, really wonderful. Well, I think we have, so, oh, and you wanted to read a little. Do you want to yeah, read, read and then we'll get to some questions after. Okay, great. Okay, so I am taking this just from the prologue. It's just like a little nice um, kind of 
slice of the relationship um, at a very critical point, which will become more apparent later in the book. Um, Round Top, Texas, 1976. The young woman awoke to the sound of scissors. She blinked the haze out of her eyes, rolled over the tangled sheets to greet him. She was 19 or so, but the crease between her brows and the wear on her skin hinted at a life not lived, but endured. He sat naked beneath the window, a stack of newspapers beside him, cutting. The light dripped down his slick black hair and pooled on his shoulders, the tops of his knees, but his face, which was bent toward his work, was only shadow. Morning, she said, her voice dry as sand. She groped the nightstand for something wet and drank the rest of a warm Dr. Pepper from who knows when. What's that? Did they see us? He continued to pump the scissors, long and heavy ones with black handles, and sniffed. You should have put ice on that, he said. She cupped her cheek, which was hot and swollen as a late summer plum. If she flicked it, she thought, it would split from ear to eye. It doesn't hurt, she said. Well, he said, it should. That does a really good job of, of the background for their relationship. And yeah, it should. <laughs> Just it should. Um, thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. So let's go to our chat and see what we have to ask. So um, our friend Kim McGee said, did your children's, did your, did your children influence Kit and Charlie's relationship or was it written before the kids came? Great question. Uh, it was, yes, it was shape. It was written before the kids came. And then when um, I was pregnant with my first child, I started developing the relationship more deeply. I would say it was thin before my children were born and it became much more palpable and um, yeah, substantial and better, honestly, once my, once my kids came. Mm. Thank you. Um, I see, uh, do you have a question or I'll read Maureen Roberts said, this sounds so good and everybody loves the reading. Um, when you were writing, did you picture any actors or actresses in the roles of Kit, Charlie, or Manny? Oh, gosh. <laughs> yes. Um, I pictured Oscar Isaac for Manny. And um, actually, a friend of mine for the lead. Um, she's a wonderful actress named Melissa Fumero. She's actually a comic actress, but I just think she would be wonderful um and as as the part of kit she was on a great popular show called Brooklyn Nine-Nine if anyone's seen it she's also just an yeah. awesome person that's yeah that'd be great you could see yeah. that yeah <laughs> um, it looks like a lot of questions have already kind of been answered um Suppose Jennifer Winbury does want to know which came first, the character or the germ of a plot? The character or? Uh, the germ of a plot. The character, yeah. It, yeah. Was Kit. it was Kit all along. She's, um, she has gotten, you know, again, deeper, more palpable, more believable, but it started with her. It just started like what, you know, if I stripped away all of my social, um, you know, uh, manners and uh, rules and expectations, you know, how might this, it's, there's almost like, there's something id-like about her. Um, and so I, I just wanted to see what would happen if, you know, if I didn't have to be so nice. So, um, and I'm, I'm saying I, I, I don't think she's me, but I think she, um, I think she could be a part of me. Oh. Um, somebody wanted to know about your classic manual typewriter behind you. <laughs> oh my gosh, great question. So this is an Underwood and this uh, came with this house, which we moved into during COVID. 
The people who lived here lived here for 60 years. It's this beautiful family. They were raised here. They're now in their 60s and 70s. And I think their great uncle was an op-ed writer for the LA Times. And this was his Underwood, Underwood typewriter. So it's from the 20s, maybe? It's very old. Wow, that's crazy. Cool. Yeah, I feel like that's a good luck charm to have. Yes, <laughs> yes. I love it. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask a question about as, like writing. Why did you choose, because you're not in Texas now. So why did you choose to write a book set in Texas where instead of maybe like a, a transplant in another city? Because it's home, because it's what I know, because it's fun. And I don't know, I'm, I'm very attracted to uh, rural settings. I think I, I spent, I've spent enough time to know it really well um but i'm also an outsider i'm enough of an outsider to see it with like a lot of curiosity and a lot of maybe some perspective um so my relationship with that area is i uh, grew up in the city most of the time but my parents were divorced um since i was pretty little so i would just go there every other weekend and then for like a month in the summers um so i was always kind of a visitor um I'm like three quarters city and one quarter country. Uh, that's a fair ratio. And I don't know. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that's home. Yeah, I get that. That's um, the best place. It's the best place. Yeah. Um, could I, it seems like your favorite part of writing kit was just having this outlet for your, for like the negative sides. And it just, could I ask if there was like a hard part of writing kit or a part that was just difficult to, to access to write a character like that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's hard to write someone who's divorced from her emotions. So mm -hmm. she doesn't have a lot of knowledge about her emotions. And so to write from the inside of someone, I use close third person as I'm writing, um, to write from the inside of someone who doesn't know what's going on, it, it takes some doing. And yeah, I had to work a lot on that actually. And I, it, the, the closest, the best way I was able to do that was through sensation versus, you know, I was so, I was so upset. She wasn't upset. She doesn't know she's upset, but like her stomach clenches and like she breaks out in a sweat across the back of her neck and her hands are in fists. That's, that that's the better I mean that's the only way that I could kind of show without her like any insight from her yeah I mean she also deals with that not being able to feel things you know and so yeah kind of the personification of life <laughs> you know like right, not able right. to feel things. yeah so then I have to go to the outside like you know she didn't feel it but there was some pressure on her shin and then you know blood dripping down into her sock oh my goodness well this has been such a wonderful half hour thank you this book is written so honestly and it's such a great capture of of this place and I know that people are gonna enjoy going here and it, it's a fabulous fabulous book so thank you for being honest in that and for bringing such a, an open honest uh commentary here so thank you oh laney thank you so much thank you essie and to all you librarians thank you for what you do uh really appreciate your tuning in of course well we're gonna you're gonna come back at the end right so we're gonna put yes. you in the green room and okay. we will see you very soon okay thank you <laughs> all righty so let's bring back that was so wonderful i mm -hmm. want to just go dive back into the con hollow again Oh, yeah. so gritty, but also just so, so heartbreaking. This young kid, you just feel for her. Oh, yes. All right. I think, hi, Adele. Adele. Hi. Hello. Hi. How are the virtual cookies? They were delicious. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to hear. Yes. Uh, well, welcome back. And uh, I am so glad to have you so i'm gonna show the book cover which this okay 
this is one of my favorite book covers that we've done this year this is gorgeous like the um I want that lighter and I don't have any need to want that lighter but I want it <laughs> I, I know I, I know I saw the um the William Morrow uh, crowdcast and you said that your friend described the cover art as a lily pulitzer dress with a hand grenade in the pocket and I just yeah. I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think, I mean, I am so impressed with the work that the team did on this. And I think they were able to capture this kind of beauty, but also edgy story, <laughs> you know, and, um, and so, yeah, I'm in love with it too. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a quick introduction, you grew up in Asheville, North Carolina, um, you have a journalism degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and you live in Brooklyn, and this is your debut novel, like we said before, so very excited to talk about it. Do you want to tell them a little background and what the book's about? Sure. Um, so the book is about a young seamstress in North Carolina in the 1940s, right at the time um, that World War II is ending. So it's a period when women have had the opportunity to take over jobs um, in factories. They've been, you know, holding down the home front while the men are at war. And uh, Maddie, the main character, she's 15 years old, finds herself uh, kind of deposited at her aunt's house in Brightleaf, which is loosely based on Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where my parents met, my grandparents lived and, and worked um, for the R.J. Reynolds family and tobacco industry there. So Maddie finds herself suddenly filling in for her aunt and sewing dresses for the women that everyone calls the tobacco wives. So the wives of these um, executives. Yeah. So that's a little bit of a, of a snapshot. Yeah, just the beginning because there's so much in this book and it's gonna, book clubs are gonna love this book because there's so much to dive into. The designs of the dresses alone, I, could, I wanted to see all of them. They were gorgeous, <laughs> the descriptions. Um, and it's, it's really unique. I don't know much about the, the tobacco industry um, in the past or in the present. And so I learned so much, but uh, there's so many great quotes and I can't help myself. I have to read a couple. So um, Lisa Wingate said, beneath the idyllic surface lie dangerous underpinning, underpinnings and a choice that will test one young woman's spirit, forcing her to weigh the relative value of profits and people. Um, beautifully rendered portrait of a young woman finding her courage and her voice. Um, let's see, Kristen Hermel, the perfect example of the kind of historical fiction I love best, a story firmly grounded in the past that still that still fills, and my Southern came out there, but still, sure still did. <laughs> <laughs> the past still feels powerfully resonant today. Uh, in your capable hands, Adele, the post-World War II North Carolina, the, ca the tobacco capital of the South comes alive in technicolor with all the glamor of Southern society, as well as the hidden underbelly of dangerous secrets and lies. <clears throat> Oh, it's so, <laughs> those are so great. And it, it goes on there. There are tons more quotes. Um, Booklist said that you set your activist novel in 1946, but the causes of the of workers and women's rights are timeless. And I want to talk about that for a bit, because a lot of this, Maddie's kind of faced with a lot of moral decisions in this mm -hmm. book when she thinks it's going to be kind of a, oh, I'm going to go help my aunt. It'll be, I'll help out. But she's really thrust into like doing right. everything. Um, there right. are, there's a talk of, you know, advertising. There's talk of like what that effect has on them, what the tobacco effect has on these people, what the women who are taking over when the men are away at war, what, what's happening to them and their conditions. Mm -hmm. There's talk of people getting sick and catching things. You know, it seems so modern. <laughs> so what was it like dealing with with those modern thoughts when you're writing historical novel? Well, it's interesting because, um, you know, initially I wasn't really thinking about that when I, when I, you know, developed the story and really got into what was going on with the women. I think it was only later that I realized how much of history is repeating itself, <laughs> um, you know, which is not surprising, but, um, but yeah, there were, there were a lot of issues, um, you know, I think representation of, of women and, you know, kind of having a seat at the table um, is still, you know, something that's an issue. I actually just started, uh, or I just finished writing an essay that kind of looks at the history of advertising to women and how much that has changed. And um, 
you know, I did a lot of research. I think I have some photos of old ads and, you know, advertising to women in those days, like some of, some of the ads are just shocking. They're so blatantly sexist and, um, and insulting. <laughs> and I work in the advertising field. You know, I've, I've had, uh, my day job is, you know, as an advertising creative and strategy person. So, um, you know, even today, I think we still see some patterns in the advertising world, um, you know, in companies uh, that, that show that women, you know, could have more of a voice and should have more of a voice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Seeing Maddie kind of find that voice is really fun too. Um, and so uh, you mentioned the advertising and you mm -hmm. probably knew about some of it because of your past, but what research went into that of stuff that you might not have known? Did you find out anything that you didn't know? I... A lot of it kind of reconfirmed things that I, I knew just because, you know, I, I um, got a journalism degree and I, I studied advertising. I studied, you know, the history and knew a lot of the, you know, techniques and, and things that were used back then. I think one thing, like looking at the congressional records from, you know, much later in history when the tobacco executives were called to testify before Congress about what they knew and when they knew it, um, as far as cigarettes being addictive. Some of that was illuminating because I was able to read, you know, transcripts, um, uh, memos that were written from the executives um, that clearly showed that, that not only did they know, but they put out messages that would um, kind of, uh, they call it actually in advertising market shaping. So they are putting out messages to shape the views of folks before this negative news comes out. So a lot of the old ads, and I, I think I have one that I sent you, it shows doctors in ads. So they knew that the science was going to come out. So they, they, you know, came out with campaigns that position cigarettes as being healthy. So it's, it's really, you know, quite remarkable what, um, what they did and what they got away with. And late, later there was legislation, you know, the FTC cracked down on them and, um, you know, they were no longer allowed to advertise uh, on television and in magazines, but, you know, they got around that and then they started doing sponsorships and, and spending their ad dollars in other ways, so. Whoops, I can't hear you my, now. My mute oh. went away and I couldn't get it back. Okay. Um, so I put one of the, the ad you were talking about on the, the not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camel. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, they use doctors, they use celebrities. Um, you know, now we call that credentialing. So, you know, you kind of borrow from someone who has credentials to, to make yourself um, seem more credible. And, you know, that still goes on today. But, you know, thank goodness there are, regulations now that um prevent this type of <laughs> blatant yeah. advertising yeah um do we do you want to show some of the other photos since you sure, have some, sure. you have some really can, great ones yeah i can talk a bit about the inspiration for the book because it's a very personal story this is a picture of my grandmother and she was really the inspiration for this story um, she was a hairdresser for the wives of R.J. Reynolds tobacco executives in the 1940s. And, you know, as a little girl, I was fascinated by these women and, you know, would ask her questions. And, and you know, we were really proud at that time of being, you know, part of the tobacco capital of the South. So there was a lot of, of pride among my family. I mean, my this grandmother who we called Memo was a hairdresser. And then I think I have another photo of my other grandmother. Uh, uh, this is my other, my maternal grandmother. Her name was Elma Minas and she was a seamstress. And so, and she also served, she specialized in wedding gowns and um, evening gowns. And so during the summers, I spent a lot of time with, with my grandparents in Winston-Salem, and I assisted her, not nearly to the degree <laughs> that Maddie <laughs> assisted. Like, I had to do quite a bit of research into sewing 
in order to write those scenes um, and those descriptions that you you mentioned, Lainey. Yeah. Um, but I definitely like a lot of those kind of visceral memories of her letting me pin, you know, the patterns on, letting me cut out certain things, you know, telling me not to use the fabric uh, scissors for anything else, you know, um, other than the fabric. Those kind of things all came from my childhood. Oh, that's so cool. And I think that, yeah, I need, I was trying to picture all of these gowns and they just seem so regal, like all of the fabrics and stuff. I'm sure you, well, you already had kind of a, a knowledge of it, but I'm sure there was a lot of research into it. I would not know where to begin, but I was fascinated by it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think we yeah. have one more with ads, uh, the advertisements. Here. Yes, I think so. And there's, yeah, there's a shot of Rita Hayworth um, there at the bottom. Uh, this is an example of misleading tobacco advertising and sexist advertising on the upper right there, which is um, this was a, a very early, even, you know, I think in the 19, late 1920s, Lucky Strike ad. So this was a very successful campaign for them, light a lucky and you'll never miss sweets that make you fat. So, you know, they... You know, it was interesting during the war, a lot of the men um, who were fighting overseas, they would send them free cigarettes. And so all of them were smoking, but I think they saw it as an opportunity to sell to women as well. And so, you know, using these kind of, um, you know, messages about, you know, aspiring to be thin or to, you know, be a good wife. I mean, you know, a lot of the, the messages that they used were designed to appeal to to women and to, you know, the ideal of the time, what that should look like. Wow. Um, let's see. So, our, yeah, and we also talk about the women in the, in the <clears throat> um, factory and what they're going through because their jobs are going to be pushed out. They're going to be pushed out soon because the men will yeah. come back and they're not really seen as uh important and then you have like these tobacco wife executive or ex sorry tobacco executives wives that um are kind of spending their day picking out their dresses and stuff and so there mm -hmm. is this class gap and I think that Maddie's Anne is very quick to say like you need to know your place but she kind of toes that line and so is she able to kind of see both sides or like how does that help her I mean, I think she's thrust into the more glamorous world of the wives. I, I think she doesn't really have a choice. And so she's kind of trying to just make her way um, and, you know, fill in for her, for her aunt and do a good job. Um, but one of the things that I found most interesting is that as she was exposed to both worlds, a lot of her illusions about the wives and, and you know, their lives and how, you know, perfect they seemed, um, you know, kind of began to crumble. And the other thing that she saw was the strength of these factory workers. And, you know, it was interesting during the research to read about, you know, for many of these women, this was the first time in their lives that they made their own money, you know, that they had the opportunity to have a job, to, you know, get that sense of satisfaction, which is something that these wealthy women didn't have. So I thought that was a really interesting juxtaposition. Um, and while the tobacco wives, the wealthy wives seemed to have it all and have a lot of power, when it really came down to it, they were powerless in many ways. Um, and so who, who really has the power? Is it these women who are working in the factory and know that they can take care of themselves? Or is it these wealthy wives who are dependent on their husbands? Um, so all of those themes were really interesting to me. Yeah, I'm so glad you you pointed those out because that is such a big thing to dive into. Like book clubs are gonna, that, that's a wonderful theme to talk about. Yeah. Um, I see, do you have anything before we do maybe some reading? Um, well, I just, I was a little curious because you have so many, so many connections to the tobacco industry with your family and so many different stories that they've told you. I was just curious how you decided to tell the story through the eyes of a 16 year old girl. It seems like there were so many different possibilities for you. Why would you, um, why did you settle on that one? Uh, what I, I mean, I think that um, having a character, a main character who 
sees this world one way and then awakens to it not being as it appears to be was really important to me. I mean, yes, I could have told it from the point of view of several different characters, but I wanted her to have this awakening and to realize um, and to learn and grow, you know, over the course of just one summer by being exposed to these very different worlds. Yeah, that was, that's awesome. Um, I just, I loved Maddie's character and I just, uh, I was just curious why, what made you choose her? And I'm glad you did. <laughs> I'll, I'll point that out, I'm glad you did. <laughs> um, I know you wanted to read a little bit to give them a, a taste. Sure, for the book. I'll just okay. give you a little, a little flavor for the book. Um, so I'm gonna read just a short passage. This is, um, Maddie has just realized that, that her mother's taking her to her, to her aunts at a time during the summer when she doesn't usually go there. Um, so she's thinking about, you know, Aunt Etta and going there. This is her aunt's name is Aunt Etta. Aunt Etta sewed for lots of folks in Brightleaf, rich and poor alike, but she really made her money in June and July sewing custom dresses and gowns for the women she called the tobacco wives. The wives were married to the richest, most powerful men in Brightleaf, the ones who owned the fields, the drying barns, the cigarette factory, practically the whole town. All June and July, Aunt Etta cut and sewed, fitted and flitted from mansion to mansion, getting the wives ready for their summer festivals and garden parties and galas. On occasion, I would get a glimpse of these women from afar when Aunt Etta took me into town. It was a thrill to see them strolling down the town sidewalks in their wide broom cartwheel hats and fitted suits or shirtwaist dresses, their hourglass silhouettes like Hollywood starlets. So this is when Maddie is still enamored with, with the wives <laughs> in the beginning of the book. Wow. It's so easy to get enamored with them. It just, all you see is glamor when you're 16 and then you see everything else. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can I can I also ask the in the uh, crowdcast interview you, you pulled out two just amazing things. You had a charm bracelet and a thimble, and I was wondering if you had those with you today. I do. I do. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know if you can see this, but but this is a thimble that my grandmother, the seamstress, left to me when she passed away. And it actually has little flowers um, that are tobacco flowers, which tobacco flowers can either be white or pink or kind of a red shade. So um, this was very special. And I, you know, I um, did a lot of writing and revising during the lockdown. And so I had to recreate in my the corner of my bedroom in my <laughs> Brooklyn apartment. Um, you know, a place to write. So I had that uh, with me on my desk when I'm writing. The other is a charm bracelet, um, which is very Southern. And, you know, there, there are charm bracelets in the book. This is one that my mother left to me. And this is a charm. Um, I don't know if you can see that. There's a big gold R and on the back, 1963 junior, senior prom. My parents met at RJ Reynolds High School. So, um, you know, they, it's just, it's funny. I, you know, I grew up in Asheville, but I really feel like my heart belongs to Winston-Salem. Like that's where my parents met. Um, you know, my father worked in the cigarette factories during his summers as a teenager. My other grandfather worked for Wachovia Bank. Like the roots are deep and, and there was a lot of pride. And so again, like, you know, just having these connections and then writing about these people has been just incredible. Yeah, it feels like if there's anyone who could have or should have told the story, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have a favorite story that any of your relatives told you? And I know you must have heard so much, but do you have a favorite? I did. Um, actually, my father, it was interesting because during this process, I learned all these things that I, I didn't know um, that my family had an even deeper, you know, even deeper connections. And a couple of the lines in the book actually come from things that he said. So he worked in a cigarette factory. I said, I mentioned when he was a teenager in the summer, it was like a great job. He said, everyone wanted to work there because the money was good. And, 
you know, they were proud. They were proud to be part of building the tobacco capital of the South. So he worked in an area where they were making the mint, mint cigarettes, which is, you know, part of the storyline in the book, this new cigarette called Moments. Um, and he said that when you walked in, the mint was so strong that it completely like stung your eyes. And he said, you know, what is that? What's that smell? And this man working on the cigarette line said, boy, that's the smell of money. And I just thought that was such a great line. That was a great line. I used totally. it. It's perfect. Yeah, that is a great line. <laughs> Yeah, that person is kind of like like they they don't know what they set in motion <laughs> no, right right yeah uh, that's one thing I love about the south they're always a good story and there's always a good line yeah. they're like yeah that was a good line yep. um <laughs> speaking of um the south and and what people say we were talking before because your book is a part of our ALC um, program where you can get an advanced listener copy. So our librarians out there go download it, download it on NetGalley or Edelweiss. I was listening to the book, which I appreciated that the narrator's, you know, Southern accent wasn't <laughs> like overwhelming. It was just so true and, and beautiful. And I think they did a wonderful job. So you got to pick that person, right? We were, I got to weigh in, um, weigh you in. know, my editor, Liz Stein, um, you know, and the team, the marketing team, came up with um, several folks to choose from. And I think we all agreed on which ones we liked the best and were able to, to get them. But yeah, I, I cringe as a, you know, Southerner, native Southerner, I cringe at some of the accents that I hear, you know, on shows or whatever. Sometimes it's just, it's over the top. So, yeah, no, I, that was, that's one thing I'm always scared of. I'm always like, oh, please, like, <laughs> let it be true, you know, and there are so many different ones. It's not like there's, there's a wrong answer, but it's just, you know, in your heart. And so I'm glad that you got that. Yeah, yeah. Got to very, happy with, very happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's really great. Um, we had a question, let's see, from Beth Thomas. Uh, she enjoyed the book so much. She actually did the audio and interspersed the book with the readings. She kind of got a full view. Uh, okay. Yeah. And she said the narrator perfectly captured how I envisioned Maddie in my head. Um, and she said, uh, I was wondering if there was a person in your life that encouraged you to speak up and follow your dreams as Cornelia did for Maddie. Oh, wow. There've actually been a number of people and, you know, it's interesting. I think sometimes people, come in and out of our lives. Um, and it may just be, you know, one conversation that makes a difference to, a, to a child. I mean, I think when I was growing up, there were, you know, my one English teacher, you know, kind of took me under her wing a little bit. Um, you know, I had, I had a difficult childhood and, and there were people along the way who helped me find my voice. Um, so I guess, I guess the answer, the short answer is there were, were many people, some who were in my life for a long time, some who just were there for a moment, but made a big impact. Yeah, that was a very uh, kind question. Yeah. yeah. Um, we do also have another question from Maureen Roberts. She says, this cover is gorgeous and the book sounds so good. How did you find the time to write this while working full time? Are you very disciplined? I'm, as a writer myself, I'm also very curious to, to how you did this. <laughs> well, you know, I, it's interesting. Like this, this book actually started as a short story when I was, I mean, in my 20s. So, you know, 20 plus years ago. Um, and I set it aside. I, it was like always kind of in the back of my mind that I wanted to write a novel and that I wanted to write a novel about these women. Um, and I, I made a commitment to myself to, to write the book um, eight years ago. And this is kind of odd, but I really think that what, what helped me is I had started to um, exercise on a regular basis and I joined this CrossFit gym and I started training for actually like a weightlifting competition and you had to like train and prepare and you know there was a meet at the end where you had to perform and 
the discipline of that changed me, I think. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to, I am going to do this. And it wasn't a consistent, you know, it was on and off over the course of eight years. I have a son who's now 15, but he was younger then. So I, you know, I would find time during my day, during, you know, my lunch hour in the morning, in the evening. I know some people say they write at the same time every day, but that didn't really work for me. Um, I found myself to be better able to kind of come in and out of my life and my writing because things would kind of percolate while I was, you know, on the subway or taking a shower and then <laughs> I'd get that down. Yeah, yeah that's that so, um, yeah. that's so fascinating. I think it's, I feel it's it's discipline either way. So maybe, maybe I need to join the gym. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's doing their new year's resolution. So there you go. Um, well, I think, oh, well, there was one very important question that we could not pass by. They said, did you pick the cover to be UNC blue on purpose is what they asked. I did not, but I was so <laughs> thankful. I think if it had been Duke blue, it would have been a real problem with my family. <laughs> Kim, yeah. That's, that's really, that was from our friend Kim McGee. She's so funny. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. This is such a fabulous story. And I mean, I love historical fiction that really transports you to that time, but also that you learned something new and mm -hmm. also all of the beautiful fabrics and dresses. Like it really was just kind of a feast for the imagination. So um, thank you for sharing. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> yeah, and that man's words and your family's legacy lives on, which is very cool. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So let's bring Carolyn in to say goodbye. Alrighty. Um, put us where everybody can see all this. There we go. Hi, welcome back, Caroline. Thank you. Um, the I hope all the cookies weren't gone. Put us where everybody can see all this. There we go. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Oh, I think um, the other audio I hope might all be. The weren't gone. Oh crap! Sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. me. <laughs> <laughs> just an echo you know I was gonna do that <laughs> okay the amount of times I do that oh no problem God. whatsoever chaos it's, this is so good they need to hear it twice so <laughs> um, <the> <laughs> um well thank you both so much for coming on I know you're big supporters of libraries and this is a fabulous hour with all of our library friends and um I just want to reiterate to everyone that these are two strong females uh in historical books set in the south and um they really find their agency and we're just so so excited to have you guys um so i don't know if there's anything else you want to say before we log off oh my goodness no just thank you for having me and thanks for listening everyone so honored to be here yes i echo what caroline said i i you know have such love for libraries. I really think that it had such a tremendous influence on me. So it's an honor to, to speak with you all today. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder to all of our, our mm -hmm. librarian friends listening, we'll be back next week. Um, and we're going to do a holiday roundup for you. So books that will be perfect for holiday giving, all holidays included, um, and maybe some books for the new year. So we hope you can join us back here again, 2 p.m. And thank you so much, Adele and Caroline, and I hope you have a, a great day. Thanks, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.